Tarzan. What does Tarzan have to do with King Leopold or George Washington Williams? I'll tell you. I don't know if any of you saw the 2016 film, The Legend of Tarzan. In that film, Samuel L. Jackson plays the character George Washington Williams. The plot of the film starts like this. As a result of the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885, where have we learned about that? The Congo Basin is claimed by King Leopold, and Tarzan is John Clayton III. He leaves Africa, he settles down in Britain with his American wife, Jane, who, is, who was raised in Africa. And George Washington Williams is going to the Congo to see all the great things that King Leopold has done and is aghast to realize that King Leopold is not doing any great things. He's doing terrible things. So I encourage you to watch the film in your free time at home. I didn't check to see if it's on Netflix, but George Washington Williams is another fascinating and little known character in American history. He was a lawyer, a clergyman, a journalist, and a historian. He's African-American. He is best known for writing the history of the Negro race in America from 1619 to 1880. He served in the Union Army during the Civil War. He was a pastor and a state legislator in Ohio for one term. After interviewing King Leopold in 1889, he described the king as one of the noblest sovereigns in the world, an emperor whose highest ambition is to serve the cause of Christian civilization. This could tell us a few things. Is George Washington Williams naive? I don't think so, but it does say that King Leopold is a very persuasive man and he can put on an image that does not show his true character. So George Washington Williams set out to visit the Congo, which is no small feat in those days, in 1890, to visit the Congo and see all these great things that were happening. He was fully expecting to be able to write about all the schools and the churches and the hospitals and how King Leopold was really reaching out and caring for these Africans. He was born on October 16th, 1849 in Bedford Springs, Pennsylvania. And he signed up for the army, but he signed up when he was 14 and lied about his age. As a child, he did not have a formal education. He was put into an orphanage and he was trained to cut hair, to be a barber, like Equiano. He was educated at Howard University, an HBCU, historically black college and university in Washington, DC, and at Wayland Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. He graduated from Massachusetts Newton Theological Institution in 1874, the same year he married Sarah Sterrett, and they had a son. He worked various jobs the next few years, pastor, editor, postal worker, state legislator. He had a, a variety of occupations. His two-volume, History of the Negro Race in America, from 1619 to 1880, received glowing reviews in respected magazines, and his second book, History of the Negro Troops in the War of Rebellion, published in 1887, also earned critical praise. Ever moving on to new challenges, Williams had been studying law and was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1881. In 1883, he began a law practice in Boston, and the publisher commissioned him to write about the Belgian Congo. 
He traveled to Congo in 1890. As I said, the Congo Reform Association was formed in the early 1900s and Mark Twain wrote King Leopold's soliloquy in 1905. So tragically, his visit to the Congo and he wrote a letter to King Leopold documenting everything he had seen, we'll find out this was not taken seriously and this did not alert the world, tragically. On his return, he wrote an open letter to his serene majesty, Leopold II, and other pamphlets which were highly critical of King Leopold. Williams was vilified in the press by King Leopold II, a smear campaign. He accused Williams of exaggerating educational credentials and Civil War service. And we have seen this happen in this country and other countries. Someone makes an accusation about somebody and their character is attacked. This is called an ad hominem argument. You're attacking the character of the person, not attacking what they said, the veracity of what they said. You're attacking the character of the person. It's, it's not fair <laughs> to do that. So these attacks had the desired effect, unfortunately. And William's att attacks on the Congo were not taken seriously. Tragically, as I said, this led to several more years of oppression, starvation, and murder until later investigations in the early 1900s confirmed all of Williams' assertions. In 1891, Williams went to England where he hoped to continue his work exposing the atrocities committed by Belgians in the Congo. Sadly, he contracted tuberculosis and pleurisy and died April, August 26, 1891. If he had lived, he might have been able to persuade people, he might have been able to rescue his reputation, but sadly that did not happen. As I said, on this trip to the Congo, he traveled, uh, and then he traveled to Belgium to interview King Leopold II. This quote from uh, laprogressive.com. Leopold, of course, extolled the glorious virtues of his new stewardship of the Congo Free State to Williams, whose interest was perked enough that he took it upon himself to visit the Congolese paradise, which ironically, Leopold ended up objecting to. He said, no, 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 you don't need to go to the Congo. That's not necessary. Let me just tell you all about it. He tried to dissuade him after learning that George Washington Williams had planned the trip. Samuel S. McClure, a famous Irish-American muckraker, journalist, had commissioned Williams to write articles about the treatment of the Congolese under Leopold's rule. George Washington Williams didn't just write the letter to His Serene Majesty, he also wrote to President Harrison. He said, quote, my travels extended from the mouth of the Congo at Banana, where it empties into the South Atlantic, to its headwaters at the Seventh Cataract at Stanley Falls, and from Brazzaville on Stanley Pool to the South Atlantic Ocean at Loango. So he covered a vast area 3,266 miles from southwestern Africa to east central Africa and back to the sea. He camped in the bushes 76 times, received the hospitality of traders, missionaries, and natives. He had 85 Africans traveling with him, none of whom died, although sometimes they suffered from fatigue, hunger, and heat. The first major letter of importance that you're also reading is open letter to His Serene Majesty Leopold II. And as you read that letter, think about a persuasive essay. He doesn't start right out giving his thesis statement, which when you're writing a persuasive essay, you shouldn't start out with your, with your thesis statement. You should build up to it. 
especially if your audience is less likely to accept it. You build up to it and then you tell them what you really think. Hoping to witness firsthand Leopold's promised philanthropic works, Williams instead left Africa angry and disillusioned. He wrote Leopold shortly after protesting how Congolese were swindled of their lands brutalized by agents of the Congo Free State, including Henry Morton Stanley. He lashed out at Leopold for allowing kidnappings, coerced labor, torture, and murder. Almost the only early visitor to interview Africans about their experience of the regime, so again, this is 1890, he took extensive notes and a thousand miles up the Congo River wrote one of the greatest documents in human rights literature. This is Adam Hochschild, who we learned about in our last lecture, who wrote King, uh, King Leopold's Ghost. So Hochschild said he wrote one of the greatest documents in human rights literature, an open letter to King Leopold, that is one of the important landmarks in human rights literature. Published in many American and European newspapers, it was the first comprehensive, detailed indictment of the regime and its slave labor system. Sadly, as we learned, only 41 years old, Williams died of tuberculosis on his way home from Africa. So his writing was there, it wasn't taken seriously, there was a smear campaign, and it sat unheeded until a, a more serious campaign for Congo reform took place in the early 1900s. In one of his letters that he wrote to the US Secretary of State, he coined a phrase that had not been used before. Now, unfortunately, it's well known. The phrase is crimes against humanity. King Leopold's attacks were successful. Leopold's supporters in America submitted an article that accused Williams of living a lie, of exaggerating his credentials, of committing adultery. The headline read, he prospered for a time, but his true character was learned. If you'll remember Martin Luther King Jr., who a lot of attacks made on him, that he was sleeping with other women, that because of this and his character couldn't be trusted. Anytime you're willing to call out uh, a country, a leader, you're willing to speak out against injustice, be willing to be attacked also. During the late summer of 1891, the Belgian parliament defended Leopold and gave a 45 page report to the press circuit basically refuting George Washington Williams' accusations. Williams' valent expose of the free Congo state cost him dearly. His health was badly damaged. His reputation was soiled by the Machiavellians rife in Leopold's global power network but he had landed some blows and sown the seeds of doubt and skepticism in Western minds about Leopold's ivory tower of colonial virtue. Again, that's from LA Progressive. This was the first battle in what would evolve into a relentless and global propaganda war, and Williams was the first martyr in the good cause of wrestling the Congo from Leopold's talents through the power of the pen. <laughs>